Michael Avery, Head of Financial Markets Research at Rabobank. Michael, good morning. Uh, how much further is this likely to go? I think the experts we've been speaking to this morning say get ready for a year in which you're going to see a repricing uh, of assets across the board. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think nobody knows how far it's going to go, but the one thing we can clearly see is that the market structure is rotten. It's a mile wide and an inch deep, mm -hmm. and it's extremely vulnerable to very sharp sell-offs like this. It has been for a very long time, and we had a very, very minor trigger. If anyone can actually point round and say, what is the event or what is the piece of data that has suddenly seen a 10% correction, um, you know, I, I would like to know, and that's indicative of the fact that it's extremely fragile. Not convinced by this uh, yield move, U.S. 10-year yield move up to 2.8% correlation uh, with the big sell-off? So that was so much more dangerous than 2.75, was it? <laughs> well, no, I think maybe it's just the, is it just the, uh, the, the realization uh, that, you know, as growth returns and as growth accelerates in developed markets like the U.S., um, that rates are definitely going to move up? Well, I think that's a structural recognition and that's a structural factor pointing to the fact that the equity market has been kept afloat by very low yields. And once yields go up, suddenly the, the bullishness of the equity market, which has kept turning around and saying the, bad, the bond market was wrong to be gloomy and that it should have been more optimistic and come on, catch up, you know, yields can come up so that you can, you know, catch up with the good news story that we're selling. As soon as that happens, the equity market sells off. So effectively, it's only being propped up by the low liquidity, sorry, the high liquidity and low yields that we're seeing. And as soon as the, mar the actual economy starts to return to normal, the equity market is no longer supported at those levels. That appears to be the story that's being told, if what you're saying is correct. No, well, no, no. You see, you don't sound very convinced about that. So what are you then attributing this sell-off to, if not the, you know, the, the marginal increase in yields, as you seem to put it? Well, I, th I, think, I think the marginal increase is very, very low. I don't think that's the proximate cause per se. I think the structural argument that you point to about the fact that the, the whole thing is propped up by ultra-abundant liquidity and low interest rates and the, the recognition that, goodness me, at some point that might go away, even if it hasn't yet, that, I think, actually certainly is the proximate underlying psychological cause. But then the reason for why you get two 1,000 down point moves in, in one week is more to do with market structure. I mean... It, it, you know, there are people infinitely better versed in this than me. I'm not going to pretend that this is my area of expertise, but certainly you've seen for a very long period of time more and more passive funds flowing into the market, ETFs, trackers, et cetera, et cetera, and fewer and fewer active managers. So effectively, instead of the, you know, instead of the tail being the back of the animal and very small, the tail is enormous and the animal is very small. So you know, as soon as a few people get this recognition that you just pointed to and I think is correct, saying, well, goodness me, we do need to sell – that's massively amplified. And the more it's amplified, the more people continue to sell. So it becomes, uh, you know, it spirals upwards, which is why you suddenly accelerate month after month after month new Dow 20x thousand baseball caps every few days. And it spirals downwards in exactly the same way. That's interesting. So you're suggesting that actually the extremities in the market right now that we're viewing uh, are mostly led by the factors that you pointed out, whether it's passive uh, fund investing or whether it's algorithmic trading uh, or robo trading or whatever you want to call it, and that actually there is a real middle band for the markets that is justified by the macros, by the world view, by the growth view. Any idea of what that middle band is? No, and I, I disagree entirely with what you okay. just said. Sorry. Um, in the same way, what's, well, well, no offense, but I mean, what's the annual average temperature in Delhi, for example? What's the annual average temperature in, uh, you know, the, uh, middle America in Idaho or somewhere like that? You'd say it's about maybe 15 degrees Celsius or something. Delhi, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But that obviously overlooks the fact that you're going to get days of 45 degree heat and days of, you know, fit minus 15 degrees Celsius. You don't actually have a nice balmy 22, 15 degrees Celsius average throughout the year. That's silly. You have boiling heat and freezing cold um, and you know <laughs> you have to deal with both of them F rather than addressing so the let me, let me rephrase that. that's the average okay let me rephrase that then uh, if you believe this fall has been exacerbated uh, by the factors that we've just discussed then what do you really think the actual value should be at this point in time where do you think the markets ought to be given where the macros are well, I think that's a, that's a function of where you think interest rates are going to be rather than just where the macro is. Because if you think the economy is here, then you have to project that forward and say, well, then interest rates should be there. And if interest rates are there, where should equities be? And my guess, and it's only a guess because no one really understands the, the, the full dynamics of this, is that if interest rates are going to be significantly higher, equities are going to be significantly lower. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. But 
You yourself alluded to this point about how the economy seems to be on the mend. At some point of time, even if there's an overshoot, there'll be a course correction. So what do you expect that to be? I mean, even if there is a further fall because of the higher interest rates, at some point of time, normalcy should return. Um, well, why? <laughs> well, because even if there are wild swings, eventually the pendulum will, pendulum will rest at the mean. Well, I just I thought I just comprehensively dismissed my dismiss that. No, view, I'm just posing a, a question. It's great to have. Okay, well, I'm, well, I, well, I, well, I just disagreed vociferously with the whole principle that was raised. I, I I actually don't think that there is a mean. I think what we have is a structural dynamic which pushes you ex extensively and excessively in one direction, and then when it unwinds, it pushes you extensively and excessively in the other direction. And, and the hope that somehow there's some happy medium between the two, I think, is just hope. <laughs> okay. But it, it's, a, it's a theory or a hypothesis I'm putting forward, but I, I can't tell you exactly where that means things need to be. But purely, I would say that in the near term, volatility picks up, and I would argue strongly that equities are likely to be lower rather than higher. But would it be fair to understand from what you've been telling us, Michael, uh, you know, that at least you think at this point, because of this extreme behavior of the markets, that we are a little oversold? Um, potentially, yeah. I mean, in a in very, very short term uh, perspective, yes, potentially. But that doesn't mean you then go in and buy unless you're very brave, because that's just a technical factor indicating that you've had a sharp sell-off in a very short period of time, you know, and you can say that's just a healthy correction. I think in an old-fashioned market where you didn't see it rise quite so quickly, a 10% correction would not have been anything to worry about or write home about. That really did used to be normal. But those were back in the days when we didn't rely on asset prices to drive the entire economy, and people used to worry about wages and investment, silly old-fashioned things like that that no one's interested in anymore. Um, you know, but now that only, all that matters is house prices and equity prices, uh, you know, clearly if they go down a few percent points is the end of the world so you know we want to focus on it far more than we used to what where do you think yields will go this year uh, which market are we talking about US which maturity? sorry the US tenure well, our view, our house view, is they're going to go a little bit higher from here, but then we actually think that we're already hitting up against the kind of ceiling, okay. which tells you that they can't, and that it's going to have you know real, serious, uh, concrete effects on confidence and on the economy. And uh, you know, whilst we're watching what's happening and constantly considering revising, our house view is that they're considerably lower by the end of the year than where they are at the moment. So you'd say it would peak at around three percent, or um, maybe even higher than that, and then move lower by the end of the year. Well, lower certainly. I wouldn't want to make a call on precisely where it okay. peaks, and I'm not even 100% sure if we're going to get through that magic 3% number. Um, if we do, I don't know how long it will hold it, because certainly the psychological impact of that, of someone saying, oh, my God, there's a 3, not a 2, is likely to make the kind of you know, chaos that we've seen in the, this week look quite small. There's all sorts of commentary on if at 3%, uh, can this valuation of the market in the U.S. be supported, right? If the yield moves up to 3%, then what kind of price earnings ratio can be supported at that level or uh, what you know and therefore how much lower will equities go do you have a view on that at all well not a technical view other than it feeds into exactly the paradigm i was just describing that you know higher interest rates are likely to mean lower equities i mean the irony is of course that, that just shows that everyone's heavily leveraged because interest rates would only be going up unless the central banks are making a big policy error in which case everything is going to get smacked and maybe that's happening but interest rates would only be going up because wages are going up. And at the end of the day, companies are supposed to want higher wages because that gives people money to buy things. So it should actually be indicating you have healthy demand, except for the fact we know that isn't actually the dynamic that's playing out. The consumers are borrowing instead, so therefore interest rates hurt them. Uh, and people are leveraging up massively with low interest rates in order to multiply their you know, exposure to the equity market, pushing prices up even higher. And that's why we're in the pickle that we're in. What should be good news is actually coming across as bad news. No, I understand this. And I think this is in some ways what we've been anticipating for the better part of the decade, especially if you were a conservative economy watcher, that you knew that at some point this was going to come and bite you in the, you know, ass, if I may use that word on morning television. You may, uh, you may, you, you may, you may. You, you <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so I, I suppose then what we're trying to understand, uh, Michael, is that how does this impact fund flows to emerging markets like India? Any views that you may have on that? How investors looking at what's going on in the US and maybe other developed markets will then look at emerging markets relatively and India and decide whether they want to continue investing here or not? Because give, you know, we're also seeing, uh, not for the same reasons, but we're also seeing the potential of rate increase in India. 
sure. And I, well, I think that's a very, very key question. And at the end of the day, this is where things become slightly unfair, because you could argue that this is largely a U.S. dynamic that we're talking about. It's a U.S.-centered problem. It's the Fed that's talking about raising rates more aggressively than other people, perhaps. But, you know, equally, we live in a global market. And if you can point to me to one particular day uh, in which the U.S. market fell out of bed very heavily and the next day Indian markets didn't follow, regardless of what's going on in India relative to the U.S., uh, then I will, you know, correct my view. But at the moment, my view is if it happens in the U.S., unfortunately, people are not going to differentiate and say, well, you know, the U.S. market is over leveraged. The U.S. market looks in trouble because the Fed's hiking rates. But never mind, I'll buy India instead. I think people will just get out of equities full stop or get out of everything. Just go back to cash. And you think that the bond markets in India might look interesting on, on the flip side? Well, when yields are rising and, you know, the RBI is talking about raising rates, no. Uh, and again, this ties into the theme that no one wants to buy any asset when rates are going up. Um, but once we start seeing that they've hit a peak and the RBI suggests that's it, we're done, whenever that is, then, you know, the yield pick up may be attractive and suddenly you might get buyers again. But in a rising rate environment, I don't see what anybody wants to buy. Michael, one question, though. This 12 months, arguably, we'll see the return of earnings, corporate earnings across markets. Uh, how does that play out in the scenario that you're painting for us right now? Well, frankly, I don't think earnings have really mattered for equity markets for a very long time. And, uh, you know, they used to. They, sh they should do because your equity price is supposed to be a, you know, a function of your projection of future earnings. But, uh, you know, look at companies like, uh, I can't name names here over the phone, but let's just say large uh, IT-based firms in the U.S., which have got PE ratios of nearly a thousand, some of them. You know, I mean, what, what does that tell you about what their earnings are? It's just absolutely insane. Um, but, you know, the market continues to basically just buy them day after day or buy and hold, presuming that at some point the P-E ratio is going to go down from 1,000 to something more normal. Um, but in that environment, I wouldn't say earnings actually really matter. So your point is, well, Michael, my last question really to you. But uh, at, the, at, the, at the average, uh, corporate earnings by and large will go up and they may not matter for maybe 10, 15 percent of the outliers, but for the rest of the markets, they would. My only question to you is in a scenario wherein the macro, as we put it, is not going to be working in your favor because of the higher interest rates and potential fund outflows from the emerging markets. And the micro comes back to work in your favor. Uh, you, you reckon that the macro pressures will weigh in on the micro positives? Well, I think that's an extremely good question. I think it depends on market sentiment. I mean, once you've got headlines of everyone panicking, generally the macro sentiment tends to outweigh the micro positives. Um, if you can drill down and see where there is real value, then absolutely try and ride out the storm and, you know, buy the dips in individual cases. But um, be prepared that if you're day trading, it's going to be a painful exercise for you. Okay, Michael, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time this morning and speaking to us at Bloomberg Quint.